So we continue from last time. Remember last time what did we do? We did a beautiful application of Fayer's theorem. We used Fayer's theorem to prove that trigonometric polynomials are dense in L2 and that enabled us to complete the proof of Parseval formula. And I also in the last part of the last capsule, I mentioned to you that we are going to be looking at a beautiful application to number theory. And here is the result. You see it on the slide, Kronecker's theorem and Weil's equidistribution theorem. So let us recall the classical result due to Leopold Kronecker, which is also known as Dirichlet's theorem in, in some books. Suppose alpha is an irrational number. Let us consider the sequence of numbers, fractional part of alpha, fractional part of 2 alpha, fractional part of 3 alpha, etc., where the brace bracket theta denotes the fractional part of theta. So you simply take the multiples, the integer multiples of alpha and just take their fractional parts. In other words, you go modulo 1, you subtract the integer part and you get the fractional. So these numbers in that you see listed in 3.6, they're all in the compact interval 0, 1 and they're distinct. Why are they distinct? Suppose for example, they are not distinct. Suppose there's a pair K and L, distinct positive natural numbers, such that the fractional part of K alpha and the fractional part of L alpha are equal. That means K alpha minus integer part of K alpha equal to L alpha minus integer part of L alpha or K minus L of alpha is an integer which means that alpha is a rational number. And that's a contradiction because we have chosen alpha to be an irrational number. Remember, right in the slide, alpha is an irrational number. It is important. So if alpha is an irrational number, these numbers listed in 3.6 are, infinite, are infinitely many. No two of them are equal. So by Bolzano and Weierstrass's theorem, you've got a compact interval 0, 1, and you've got infinitely many points there. They must have a limit point. So sequence 3.6 must have limit points in the closed interval 0, 1. Well, that is not good enough. Kronecker's theorem tells you great deal more than that. It says that not only the sequence 3.6 has limit points, it has got lots of limit points. In fact, every point of the closed interval 0, 1 is a limit point. Stated differently, the points listed in 3.6, the numbers listed in 3.6 are dense in the interval 0, 1. So Kronecker's theorem is a density theorem. And this is very classical and you will see the proof of it in elementary books in number theory or analysis. Let us prove this simple fact. Let us begin with a simple observation that instead of proving that the numbers 3.6 are dense in the closed interval 0, 1, it is enough to prove that m plus n alpha, where m and n vary over all the integers, this h is dense in R. Because if I prove that this h is dense in R, then h intersect this interval 0, 1 would be dense in this interval 0, 1 and our job will be done as soon as we observe that h intersect this interval 0, 1 is precisely the numbers listed in 3.6. It is clear that each of these numbers n alpha fractional part lies in h intersect 0, 1. Conversely, if you take a point x in h intersect the interval 0, 1, then this x is already equal to the fractional part of x because I removed 1 from the interval, remember? And so this is going to be equal to m plus n alpha because my x is in h. And so this is going to be m plus square bracket n alpha plus brace bracket n alpha. And, and so this shows that this m plus square bracket n alpha must be 0. And so this x must be brace bracket n alpha. So we have shown that in order to prove Kronecker's theorem, 
it suffices to show that this capital H, this set capital H displayed here is dense in the set of real numbers. It's pretty clear that these numbers listed in H, they form a subgroup of R. That is capital H is a subgroup of the group of real numbers and capital H is not cyclic. This is not a cyclic group. I'd like you to explain why this is not a cyclic group. Because if H were a cyclic group, it will be generated by a single element T. It will be generated by a single element T, right? This T is obviously not 0. And so what are the elements of H then? 0, plus minus T, plus minus 2T, plus minus 3T, etc. Right? And clearly, uh, this is not going to be H. I cannot get m plus n alpha as multiples of integer multiples of a single t. The result now follows from a more general result in the next slide. We prove the following result, theorem 34. If a subgroup of R is not cyclic, then it is dense in R. In our case, the h in the previous slide is not cyclic and hence it is dense in R. I am leaving it to you to figure out why it is not cyclic. If it were cyclic, it would be generated by single element T and explain why multiples of a single element T cannot give you all possible numbers in H. And hence it must be dense in R. H must be dense in R and that completes the proof of Kronecker's theorem. To show that H is dense in R, where H is a non-cyclic subgroup, H is non-cyclic, so in particular H is not a zero subgroup. So take an element in H other than zero, then minus X is also in H, which means that H contains both X and minus X. X is not zero. One of these two must be positive. So H contains positive elements. So now let us look at the set of all positive elements in H. Let us look at the set of all positive elements in H and let us take mu to be the infimum of all the positive elements in H. This mu is non-negative. Of course, it's not clear that mu is strictly positive. Infimum is different from minimum, remember always. So we will show that if this infimum is strictly positive, then H is cyclic. Well, suppose if mu is in H, suppose if this infimum is in H, then let us look at H intersect open interval mu to mu. This H intersect open interval mu to mu is empty because if Y belongs to H intersect open interval mu to mu, then y minus mu will also be in H and y minus mu is positive and strictly less than mu which is a contradiction. So it is very easy to see that H intersect open interval mu to mu is empty. Similarly one will check that H intersect j mu j plus 1 mu is empty for each j. And then H will be the cyclic group generated by mu. Because H doesn't contain the open interval mu 2 mu. H doesn't contain the open interval 2 mu 3 mu. H doesn't contain the open interval 3 mu 4 mu. So from the real numbers, you scoop out the intervals mu to 2 mu, 2 mu to 3 mu, 3 mu to 4 mu, etc. So what is left over will be exactly mu, 2 mu, 3 mu, 4 mu and negatives of that and that would mean that H is cyclic and that's a contradiction. So now we are shown that if this infimum is positive and if this infimum lies in H, then H is cyclic. What if the infimum is positive and the infimum doesn't belong to H? We are assumed that the infimum is positive, we are going to arrive at a contradiction, we have two cases, mu belongs to H mu doesn't belong to H, mu belongs to H's case is dismissed. 
So now let us assume that mu is positive and mu doesn't belong to H. So you got an infimum of a set of numbers and the infimum doesn't belong to the set. So there is a sequence Xn of positive elements, there is a sequence Xn of positive elements in H which converge to mu. And remember that if you have a sequence of real numbers, it has a monotone subsequence. So we may assume by passing to a subsequence that the Xn, the sequence of Xn of positive elements which converge to mu is actually decreasing. It is strictly decreasing. So there is no loss of generality in assuming that there is a strictly decreasing sequence of elements in H converging to mu. And take epsilon equal to mu by 2 because mu is positive. Then there is an n naught such that xn minus mu mod less than mu by 2 for all n bigger than or equal to n naught. Now I am going to take two things n and m both larger than n naught. Both n and m are larger than n naught. So this inequality will be true for both n and m which means that what does this inequality mean? xn and xm both lie in the interval mu by 2, 3 mu by 2 and it is a strictly decreasing sequence. So mu by 2 less than xn less than xm less than 3 mu by 2. So what happens to xn minus xm? xn minus xm is less than mu but xn minus xm is in H and, mu, uh, and xn minus xm is positive and mu is the infimum of all the positive things. So that is a contradiction because that thing is less than mu by 2. So mu bigger than 0 is ruled out. Now let us take up the case mu equal to 0. So the only case that is left over is mu equal to 0. We show that in this case every interval, open interval of positive length contains an element of H. Since there is a sequence of elements in H converging to 0, remember that the infimum of positive things in H is 0. So I can pick a sequence in H consisting of positive numbers going to 0. And I got this interval AB of positive length B minus A. So one third of B minus A is positive. So take a YN such that 0 less than YN less than one third of B minus A. There must be a least natural number k such that k y n exceeds a Archimedean property which means that k minus 1 y n is less than or equal to a or k y n is less than or equal to a plus y n. So where are we? We have a less than k y n, k y n is less than a plus y n a plus y n is less than a plus one third of b minus a which is less than b. So we see that k y n is contained in this open interval a b but y n was in my subgroup h and so k y n is also in my subgroup h. Proof is complete. So we are given a very elementary argument to prove Kronecker's theorem. This argument is quite elementary but now we are going to give another proof of Kronecker's theorem but this second proof will use Feyer's theorem but what we are going to do is we are not going to just prove Kronecker's theorem we are going to prove a remarkable sharpening of Kronecker's theorem. So before we take up this second argument for Kronecker's theorem and its sharpening of Kronecker's theorem let us look at a few exercises and these exercises could be discussed in elementary analysis courses. Take the sequence sin 1, sin 2, sin 3 dot dot dot. The sequence is clearly bounded above by 1. But how do you know that 1 is the least upper bound? 1, 2, 3 etc. are measured in radians, remember? And so sin 1, sin 2, sin 3 are quite intractable as far as computation is concerned. You can't just compute these values and approximate them very easily. That's not possible. It's not clear that 1 is the least upper bound of the sequence. But it, it is true. 1 is indeed the supremum of the sequence sin n. 
and to prove that rigorously you will need Kronecker's theorem. So that's the first application of Kronecker's theorem. Now let us take a second example. Suppose you got a continuous function f from r to r and you got two periods lambda and mu. What does it mean to say that the function is periodic? It means that f of x plus lambda equal to f of x for all x. Similarly, f of x plus mu equal to f of x for all x. And this lambda and mu, these two numbers lambda and mu are linearly independent over the rationals. Remember that the real numbers form a vector space over the rationals. And these two real numbers mu and lambda are linearly independent over q. Then you have to show that f is constant. This is another application. The third application is discussing periodic solutions of differential equations. Now this is something that we should be teaching to the students who learn differential equations at the sophomore level. They got a beautiful forced harmonic oscillator. Y double prime plus Y equal to sine root 2t. What is the frequency of the forcing function? Root 2. What is the natural frequency of this harmonic oscillator? 1. Because the complementary function is C1 sine t plus C2 cosine t. So if you forget the right hand side, if you make the right hand side 0, the solution is C1 cos t plus C2 sine t. But now it's a forced harmonic oscillator. And so the general solution of this differential equation is C1 cos t plus C2 sine t plus A sine root 2t where the A has to be computed using the method of undetermined coefficients or the method of variation of parameters. Use your favorite method. You could use Laplace transforms if you like. Whatever be your favorite method to solve, find the particular integral. But you need to show that since the frequency of the forcing function namely root 2 is not a rational multiple of the natural frequency 1. The natural frequency and the frequency of the forcing function are linearly independent over the rationals. One of them is not a rational multiple of the other. This differential equations will have very few periodic solutions. Which of these solutions are periodic? C1 cos t plus C2 sin t plus A sin root 2t. The A you have to find by the method of undetermined coefficients. C1 and C2 are arbitrary constants. So I could choose C1 to be 0 and C2 to be 0 and my solution is simply A sin root 2t. That is clearly periodic. But if one of the constant c1 and c2 is non-zero, then the solution is not going to be periodic. So in fact, I have done exercise 3 for you except for finding the constant a. Of course, you need to show the non-periodicity when c1 or c2 is non-zero. You may have heard of Lissajous figures in connection with coupled harmonic oscillators in physics. For example, you can look at this book of Resnick and Halliday, for example. Suppose you got a cathode ray oscilloscope and in the x direction, you input a signal and you input another signal in the y direction. If these two signals, the frequencies are not rational multiples of each other, you will only see a rectangle which is dimly lit. Whereas if the x input and the y input are linearly dependent over the rationals, then you will see some beautiful patterns and these are Lissajous figures. And some of these Lissajous figures are depicted in elementary physics books. Now you must examine this in connection with Kronecker's theorem. Because when you give an x input and you get a y input, you are looking at sinusoidal inputs. Both these inputs are supposed to be sinusoidal and with frequencies which are incommensurate. You should discuss this in the light of Kronecker's theorem. These are three exercises for you. So now let us go to Weyl's equidistribution theorem. Weyl's theorem sharpens Kronecker's theorem. Now suppose for example you take two numbers a and b 
0 less than a less than b less than 1. We know that the open interval a b contains infinitely many points of the sequence 3.6. Let k n be the number of points among the first n that lie in the interval a b. What can you say about the ratio of k n by n? Kronecker's theorem only tells you that kn is positive if n is sufficiently large. It does not tell you that this kn by n has any kind of limiting value or anything. Weil's theorem says that kn by n actually converges to b minus a. What is the meaning of this in heuristic terms? You are looking at the number of points in the list 3.7 that land up in the open interval a b and that number you are calling k n. So, you can think of a game of darts. It is like a, a dart board which is the open interval 0 1. Think of the interval 0 1 as a dart board and these points fractional part of alpha, fractional part of 2 alpha, fractional part of 3 alpha, fractional part of 4 alpha, they are the darts. You have taken a fixed interval a b, you have taken a fixed interval a b and each iterate 2 alpha, 3 alpha, 4 alpha, each time you take a multiple of alpha, you ask the question whether the fractional part j alpha does it fall in this interval a b or not. It is like a dart game, game of darts where you throw darts. Now, in n iterations, that is in the first n iterates 3.7, how many times do you land up in the open interval a b? That is the question and that number is k n. So, k n by n is the relative frequency with which these numbers enter the interval a b. And so, if it is the limit of k n by n as n tends to infinity, that is going to be the asymptotic relative frequency with which these numbers 3.6 enter a specified interval a b. And what the theorem says is that this asymptotic relative frequency is b minus a, there is the length of the interval. So, it means that the asymptotic relative frequency with which these numbers will enter a specific interval i only depends upon the length of the interval. It does not depend on the position of the interval, whether the interval is on the left or the interval is on the right, it does not care. It only says that the asymptotic relative frequency with which these numbers 3.6 will, will enter the interval only depends on the size of the interval. Of course, once you prove it for intervals, it will be true for all measurable subsets. And so, you say that these numbers 3.6 are uniformly distributed modulo 1. So, this is a very beautiful and the most basic example of uniform distribution modulo 1. To prove this uniform distribution modulo 1, we are going to use Feyer's theorem that the trigonometric polynomials are dense. The uniform convergence or the arithmetic means or the partial sums of the Fourier series. Weil's equidistribution theorem itself is a very special case of a very general theorem called the individual ergodic theorem of Birkhoff. We shall talk about this in the next capsule but very briefly because that is a very vast area and this is a very beautiful and a very popular example in dynamical systems. The theory of measure theoretic dynamics discusses these kinds of problems. And there are a variety of such problems that arise in dynamical systems and number theory and how Fourier series enables us to understand these kinds of problems. And here is a nice illustration of this and I think it is a good idea to stop this capsule here. Thank you very much.